and who's going to take who would take this proton here? Well, uh, I don't know, maybe this might take the proton uh, over here, or maybe another hydroxide would take the proton. I don't know who's going to take the proton. But anyway, the proton is going to drop off. That doesn't look so good. That leaves us with a bunch of uh, negative charges, doesn't it? Yeah, leaves us with some. Uh, Maybe the carboxylate is going to take the uh, the proton. Yeah. Yep. No, nope. that's a good suggestion. All right. Uh, now at this point, this oxygen can certainly protonate. Sure. It can pick up a proton. This still would not be protonated under basic conditions. And let's say now that we do a second step where we add aqueous acid, now we can protonate the carboxyl group. And here's the final product we were going towards all along. Notice that we started with the phenol, and we actually ended up still with the phenol but now with this carboxy group on. Okay, the mechanism turned out to be more complicated than I thought. I thought it was worth going through it though because it confirmed the intuition you had before that sometimes in the phenoxide it's the O carbon that's the nucleophile and not the oxygen. So we just need to memorize here that this is the nucleophile in this case. And we're going to see that when it's a reaction with CO2. That's right. Okay. We just need to memorize that. So we've seen that if you have phenoxide and you just have a normal um, alkyl halide or alkyl sulfonate, you just do a normal SN2 with the oxygen. That was our Williamson synthesis. But with carbon dioxide, we're just going to memorize that it's actually this carbon is the nucleophile. Okay. Well, you usually wouldn't want to go through this whole mechanism every time. So let's kind of summarize what the key reaction is here. So we've seen that um, the negative charge here, the base is going to deprotonate the phenol. And then it turns out that in the presence, whoa, I'm still messing this up. in a separate step or not. Maybe you can add it with the sodium hydroxide. I'm not sure. Okay. So we can use a base to deprotonate the phenol. Then we can put in carbon dioxide and the phenol, the phenoxide will attack the carbon dioxide, except we know that it's actually going to be this carbon that attacks. Like so. Mm -hmm. Under basic conditions, this would remain deprotonated, so we have to add some aqueous acid to protonate it. So overall, we're, um, this is called a carboxylation. Earlier, we already saw how we can um, add carbon. We can have Grignards attack carbon dioxide to make carboxylic acids. We call that a carbonation reaction. When a Grignard attacks a carbon dioxide to make a carboxylic acid, well, here's another case where we have a nucleophile attacking the carbon dioxide to make a carboxylic acid. Uh, and the key thing is it puts the carboxylic acid group over here, not on this oxygen. This is what's called the Colby carboxylation. Colby carboxylation. 
you wouldn't normally go through the whole mechanism each time, but the key part is we know that we're not too surprised that actually the carboxy group ends up on this carbon because there's a resonance structure where this carbon has a negative charge after we do. Will it ever end up on the P position? That seems very reasonable too. It seems like it can end up in the P position. That's a very good point because there's another resonance structure where this has the negative charge, but they didn't say anything about that in the, the, the notes here. So for some reason, um, that doesn't seem to be as good a reaction. I'm not really sure why that wouldn't work though. That does seem reasonable. That's a good question. So there is some extent where we just have to memorize what's happening here. That's something else that we can do with the deprotonated phenol. As usual, going over a lot of uh, reactions here. Uh, uh, the, the real key is if you can find some time to do some practice problems to, to get comfortable with those, but that lays out the basic idea. Did you get to the point in the videos where they talk about the benzylic carbon? Maybe you have this. Um, a little bit. It's more reactive. Yeah, okay. good. That's right. Can you point to the benzylic carbon? Maybe in this new starting material. Where is the benzylic carbon? It's um, right after the oxygen to the right. Okay. This is the benzylic carbon. That's right. And you're right. You remembered correctly that benzylic carbons are more reactive than normal carbons. What are some things that you can do with a benzylic carbon? I, I, again, I don't know how much of the videos you saw. One thing you can do is that you can oxidize benzylic carbons all the way to carboxylic acids. Um, you can also do um, radical halogenations. And those are both things that your instructor talked about in the notes, uh, but maybe since they're in the videos, we won't spend time on that. There is one reaction I didn't talk about in the videos, though, that I think is important, so let's go over this. Now, these are reagents that we saw a lot when we were working with alkenes. When we were working with alkenes, we saw how we could hydrogenate alkenes, uh, add a hydrogen to each of the alkene carbons using a metal catalyst. And this is, uh, again, we're going to be adding um, two hydrogens. So just to remind you, The palladium is simply a catalyst that helps us to add one hydrogen to this carbon and one hydrogen to this carbon. Well, we're going to do something kind of similar in this case. What we're going to do now is we're going to add one hydrogen to this oxygen and one hydrogen to this carbon. So it's kind of going to be like a hydrogenation again. We'll add a hydrogen to this carbon and to this oxygen. Notice that we're adding the hydrogen to the benzylic carbon. Uh, well, that's not surprising because we know those are more reactive than normal carbons. Now, what's going to happen here? Well, notice if the oxygen forms a new bond to a new hydrogen, it's going to have to break this bond. Well, that's okay because when this carbon forms a new bond, it's going to have to break its bond too. Let's remind ourselves that right now, this has two hydrogens, but now it's going to be gaining a third one. So near, here's the new hydrogen that's attached to this oxygen. Mm -hmm. And here's the new hydrogen that's attached to this carbon. So you're just producing uh, uh, toluene Good. and uh, alcohol. Very good. It's always good to try to identify what your products are. Toluene. Toluene. That's right. It's good that you identified the functional groups. We're producing toluene and an alcohol. That's right. What type of functional group did we start with here? Uh, we started with an ether. Yeah. And we're showing how we can turn the ether into an alcohol and just a toluene here. All right.
we won't worry about the mechanism here. We never really worry about mechanisms for hydrogenations. Okay. Uh, but so this is a very simple reaction. We're going to cleave this bond and add a hydrogen to each of these places. Now, we might just treat this hydrogen like a hidden hydrogen. We don't always draw the hydrogens on carbons. So if you wanted to, you could just draw this product like this. But we know that you can't have a hidden hydrogen on an oxygen, so you have to draw this hydrogen in over here. So what does it take in order to do this? We need a benzylic ether as the starting material. Why is this called a benzylic ether? Because it's the benzylic carbon that's connected to the oxygen. 